Carnegie Hall in New York City, the home of the world's greatest musical events. Today's event is one in a series of New York Philharmonic Young People's Concerts under the musical direction of Leonard Bernstein. And here is Mr. Bernstein. Hello. <clears throat> Last year, if you remember, we all had a birthday party here in Carnegie Hall in honor of the great composer Gustav Mahler who would have been, at that time, 100 years old. Now, today, we're going to have a 60th birthday party for another great composer, our own loved and admired Aaron Copland. And this time, we're going to meet him in person later in the program. When you do meet him, I think the first thing about him that will strike you is his youthfulness. Not only the youthfulness of his face, but also of his smile, of his conducting vigor, of his almost boyish personality, and especially of his spirit. It wouldn't be possible to list for you all the things Mr. Copeland has done for the young during his lifetime, the dozens of young composers he has rooted for and brought success to, and the even more dozens whom he has taught at Tanglewood and Harvard and all kinds of other places, and most of all, the many pieces he has written mainly to be performed by young people. You may remember that last year we also devoted a whole program of this series to his exciting young people's opera, The Second Hurricane, which is, by the way, being released on Columbia Records this month in honor of his 60th birthday. Well, today, we're going to begin our Copeland birthday party with a young people's overture. Now, of course, you remember what an overture is from the last program. I don't have to tell you. This is an overture he wrote for the High School of Music and Art Orchestra here in New York City. It's called an outdoor overture, and I think you'll understand immediately why he called it outdoor as soon as you hear those athletic, marchy rhythms and buglish trumpet calls and those long melodies filled with fresh air and light. Here is Aaron Copeland's outdoor overture.
Now, that's what you call an outdoor overture. It really gets your blood going like a brisk trot in the woods. And it's very typical of Copeland, that easy, fresh style, so frank and open-hearted. But it shows us only one side of Copeland's music because the truth is that his music is full of variety, sort of like a flower garden. There are big, juicy, white flowers and little thorny ones and great majestic bushes and tiny shy little buds, all kinds. But perhaps the main difference among his compositions is between the big white ones, which are so easy to see and appreciate and even to love, like the overture we just heard, and those thorny ones that aren't so easy to see and love right off the bat, 
and are sort of tricky to handle, especially at the first touch. But since some of Copland's greatest compositions are thorny ones, I don't see why we shouldn't play one of them too, especially for you, this audience of young people, because as I always say, your minds are wide open to everything, old and new, even more than your elders. And besides, these thorny pieces aren't really so frightening once you know a little about them. Here's a short one, for instance, one of a series of six short pieces for orchestra called simply Statements. Now, each of these statements has a name describing its particular feeling. And the one we're going to hear is called dogmatic. Now, that's a very grown-up hard word, meaning stubborn, believing firmly in something and refusing to be talked out of it. Dogmatic. So this piece begins with a musical idea that seems to be made of rock. It's so hard and firm. It goes like this. Granite, iron, dogmatic, you see. Besides, don't forget that this is modern music, music of our time, and we're living in some pretty rocky times. Music changes and grows all through history, the way all ideas do, and what used to be considered right and normal is very different from what's right and normal these days. For instance, in the middle of this piece, the uh, brass instruments suddenly blare out a thorny, almost angry theme that goes like this. That's not exactly what our elders would have called a melody, is it? And yet it is a melody. Just look, if I change it just a little bit, not change the notes at all, but only the highness or lowness of them, then the theme would come out like this. Now that already sounds a little bit less angry, doesn't it? Without all that leaping around from high to low and back again. But I can make it seem even more normal, more old fashioned, so to speak, by putting old fashioned chords underneath the melody, like this. Now that could have been written by Liszt or anybody a hundred years ago. But this is music of today, and so Copland doesn't use those harmonies from long ago. And also, he does make the theme jump furiously from one register to another, so that it does come out modern, angry, and, as we say, dogmatic. So as we play it for you now, and this whole thing is less than two minutes long, I'd like you to try and feel yourselves like iron, stubborn and dogmatic, and see if this little piece doesn't completely satisfy that emotion you're feeling. Here it goes.
Now, don't clap. You're not supposed to. It's over. But it's as if Copeland's music were saying, this is what I have to say, and I don't care whether you agree with me or not. But that's just one side of his music, the dogmatic side. But as I said before, his music has many different sides, and the rest of the pieces on this program are much friendlier flowers, as you will see in a minute. And the one thing they all have in common, these flowers, is American roots. Don't forget that Aaron Copeland was born in Brooklyn, which makes him a 200% American, and also that he was born exactly in 1900, the first year of this century, which makes him 200% a composer of our time. Besides, it also makes it so easy to remember how old he is, because he's always just as old as the year we're in. In 1920, he was 20. In 1940, he was 40. And now he's 60 in 1960. Isn't that a lucky break? Well, now the first of these American Roots pieces we're going to hear is a dance from a work he wrote way back in 1925. How old would he have been then? You tell me. <laughs> Brilliant. Anyway, 1925 was around the time he was first making experiments using jazz in symphonic music. Now, this piece is called Music for the Theater, and the dance we're going to hear from it is called Dance. I'm sure I don't have to explain anything to you about the jazz sounds in it. You'll recognize them right off, plain as day, as soon as those trumpets put jazz mutes into their horns and the drums start their syncopated rhythms and the little high clarinet begins to squeak out this barrel house tune. That's real tough, big city music. And to make it even more big city-ish, uh, Copeland has stuck into the music the old tune, East Side, West Side, you know. Only he's modernized it from a waltz into five, eight times so that it comes out sounding like this. Now, I'm sure you also heard those funny little notes that are going on over the tune. Mm -hmm. Well, that's another modern side to this music, sort of little on purpose wrong notes that make you want to laugh, which is about as thorny as this particular flower ever gets. It's all meant to be fun, kind of like Coney Island music or clown music, and I hope you find it as much fun as we do. Thank you. 
Well, we've just had a jazzy example of Copland music. So now let's turn to one that's just the opposite, very quiet and serious, but just as American in another way. In 1940, Copland wrote a beautiful and famous score for a movie called Our Town, about life in a small New Hampshire town called Grover's Corners, where life is quiet and sweet and unhurried and very close to nature. Now we're going to hear the opening music from that film, Our Town, which is another side of America, another route, far from the noisy big city we heard about before. This is the simple, rural American life that is such an important part of our country. Copeland has often painted that side of America for us, too, in his music, as in his famous ballet, Appalachian Spring, and in his opera, The Tender Land. But perhaps in this little piece from the film, Our Town, he's painted it best of all, because it seems so real, so quiet, and so deeply felt. Here it is. Isn't, isn't that a lovely picture of American life, so different from that jazzy dance we heard before? And now we move on to an even differenter picture of American life, just as American in its roots, but thousands of miles away in the great west of our country. Copeland seems to be just as fascinated by the west, by its exciting history, its pioneer spirit, and the tremendous size of its plains and mountains as he is by our big cities and our small towns. He's written two very famous ballets about the West, Billy the Kid and Rodeo, or Rodeo, whatever you call it. Uh, we're going to hear now the final dance from Rodeo, or Rodeo, which is called 
hoedown. Now, I guess you all know what a rodeo is, but maybe you don't all know what a hoedown is. It's a square dance with all the trappings, fiddlers and callers and swinging your partner and the rest. Well, we don't have any callers here or any partners to swing, but we sure do have fiddlers. Wait till you hear them. Now, now we have a very special birthday surprise coming up. The great American baritone, William Warfield, is going to sing two of Copeland's songs for us. Now, these songs are not really original compositions, since they are really old American folk songs that almost everybody knows. But Copeland has arranged them with his special style and orchestration and with such a personal understanding and love for them that they seem to come out as brand new compositions by him. I don't know quite how he does it. It's part of the magic that goes on in this wonderful garden we're in today. Somehow Copeland's magic touch has given these old songs new color and new shape. Now the names of the two songs are The Boatman's Dance and I Bought Me a Cat. Here is Bill Warfield.
understand. The boatmen sing, the boatmen up to everything. When the boatman gets on shore, he spends his cash and works for more than dance. The boatman dance, oh dance, the boatman dance, oh dance all night till broad daylight. Go home with the gals in the morning. Oh, I never see a pretty girl in my life that she was a boatman's wife. Then dance, boatman, dance, oh, dance, boatman, dance. Oh, dance all night till broad daylight. Go home with your gals in the morning. Oh, And now we come to the big climax of our party, which is that we're going to meet Aaron Copeland himself, who will conduct for us one of his most famous pieces, the Salon Mexico, or as they say in Spanish, El Salon Mexico, which is one of his very friendliest, least thorny compositions. You see, El Salon Mexico is the name of a dance hall in Mexico City, sort of like our Roseland which Copeland once visited and was so excited by what he heard and saw there that he wrote a piece about it. And so I take tremendous personal pleasure in welcoming to this podium a great composer, a dear person, a true friend to youth, 
one who has guided and encouraged so many young people, including myself, when I was just starting out. So my thanks, our thanks, the thanks of all musicians and all music lovers all over the country and all over the world, happy birthday, Aaron Copeland.
from Carnegie Hall, another in the New York Philharmonic Young People's Concerts, under the musical direction of Leonard Bernstein, has been presented by Shell Oil Company, sign of a better future for you. This is the second in a series of four concerts in the Young People's Series. The next concert will be presented five weeks from today on Sunday, March 19th, at which time Mr. Bernstein will present three soloists and three youthful conductors in a program devoted to young performers. The preceding program was pre-recorded at Carnegie Hall, New York City, and was produced and directed by Roger Englander.